So uh, we're presenting a case of a splenic artery aneurysm embolization. Next slide. This is a 66-year-old uh, uh, gentleman who has a history of a uh, prior thoracic aortic aneurysm repair. He was noted to have a prior splenic artery aneurysm that measured 2.2 centimeters, which has now enlarged to 2.6 centimeters on surveillance CT. Next slide. So as you can see on these two uh, CTA images, we've got arrows pointing to our sacular aneurysm. The inflow and the outflow are both on top of each other on the sagittal image. We currently have our mesocatheter uh, through the outflow of the aneurysm next to the splenic. Next slide, please. So again, just a summary of this. This is a gentleman with a 2.6 centimeter splenic artery aneurysm that's been enlarging in size. We're planning on doing an embolization. Other treatment options that we consider were surveillance or uh, surgical. This particular patient We've actually been following him for uh, almost five years now. His uh, uh, dissecting aneurysm uh, was treated at the turn of the decade, and we knew he had a, a visceral aneurysm at that time. It was uh, uh, significantly smaller at that time, and so we felt very comfortable with him in a surveillance protocol because he was going to be surveyed for his uh, uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm. And uh, as many of these do, it uh, progressed about one to two millimeters a year for the last four to five years. And so now we're, we're seeing it, you know, it's, it's easily 2.6 centimeters in one dimension in, in, the, uh, in the, you know, long axis. It's uh, close to three centimeters in size. So there's been objective growth of this. And uh, the patient is, you know, well recovered, is very, very functional after his uh, open descending thoracic re repair. As our standard protocol, we have a uh, six French slender sheath in the patient's left wrist, uh, which you can zoom in here to uh, see this, hopefully. Thank you. So we actually have a, uh, a seroradial catheter, 110 centimeter seroradial catheter. Next, please. And here you can see the wires prolapsing down the you know, descending aorta. Next, please. And uh, because of the dissection actually creates very interesting anatomy here. We had to make sure we were in the, the true lumen and not the false lumen. We had to make sure that the, uh, the correct lumen was filling the celiac artery. And you can see here that there's a persistent uh, dissection with an ectasia of the abdominal aorta. So you know, not the easiest case. And so here's our, our seroradial. We've successfully catheterized the celiac artery. Uh, and I, I, I think everybody would agree this aneurysm is at least, you know, twice the size, if not three times the size of, of, the, of the native inflow and outflow vessels. What we did here, uh, because the seroradial was in fact hubbed at the wrist, and obviously that's a 110 centimeter catheter, we had no room to advance it. And now we have a four French 125 centimeter catheter right at the inflow to the aneurysm. Uh, and uh, I like this setup. I think it's a very stable setup just because we have such good purchase into the celiac artery. Uh, at this point, the four French catheter is completely hubbed. Uh, and I think if you go back to the wrist again, you can see that our four French catheter is completely hubbed here. Um, and this is where we're going to start our procedure. So. The diameter of the splenic, it's about 26 by 30. The sorry, sorry. The, the, the aneurysm. Sorry, okay, but the diameter of the splenic artery. Oh, 10, 10 to 11 based on where you're measuring it. Okay. okay. Uh, what we're going to you know, share with you as, as much as we can is we're going to you know, coil the outflow, uh, come back, coil the aneurysm itself, and then coil the, uh, the uh, inflow. Hopefully we'll be done in about, you know, 20 minutes or so. We, we have a, uh, we have a uh, 018 detachable coil uh, that we're about to uh, introduce into the outflow vessel. Uh, we have a uh, 021 uh, microcatheter, uh, which is 150 centimeters long, which is obviously necessary uh, if you're going to be uh, doing these cases from a radial approach. Uh, and so uh, it's exposed past the 035 catheter by about, you know, 10, 15 centimeters, as you can see here. Uh, so we've only got about 
10 centimeters or 15 centimeters of microcatheter outside the patient's uh, uh, wrist, uh, which is, from my perspective, a very comfortable working length ergonomically. So the, you can see the coil actually exiting the microcatheter now, and we're going to see if we can get it to land right here on the bifurcation. And so Rob, you mentioned that this was 10, 10 millimeters, this diameter. So what size coil did you select for this? We're using a 14 millimeter diameter coil. Which, what kind of coil? Some and this will, this will be our, our, our first coil, obviously the first coil and the last coil are the, are the most Im important from a technical point of view. So this may take you know, a couple of minutes just to get it to seed the right way. Uh, that actually looks really nice, the fact that we're seated on the bifurcation. There's a question for the audience. I think it a little bit. So we're just going to you know, play with this for a couple of minutes until we can really get it to seed nicely right at that uh, bifurcation area. So you know, I, I am a big believer in stent assist coiling when there's no other option, when you're completely convinced that you're going to have organ infarction. Um, I have never seen any data about long-term freedom from reintervention in stent assist coiling cases, especially when it's this kind of fusiform morphology. Um, it's not you know, clear to me really what you're doing if you're you know, still having a, a pressurized um, a bloodstream going directly through the center of this aneurysm. Um, what we found, uh, and we have you know, you know, five-year follow-up on the majority of our cases, in many instances, eight to 10-year follow-up, is that when you have a proximal aneurysm like this, there's so much robust collateral circulation through the, le through the left gastric, the short gastrics, through the gastroepiploic, that there's really no incidence of end organ in, in, infarction. The, the one caveat to that is the portal hypertension population, uh, where you know, they clearly have splenomegaly, and in many instances, the collaterals really cannot pick up the slack, so to speak. And so you tend to have uh, a localized area of ischemia at the poles, typically, uh, of the spleen. Uh, but for a case like this, I, I think that the risk of a significant splenic infarct is as is, is, is close to zero as you can possibly get. It's really akin to a surgical ligation. Uh, so what we've evolved into uh, is that once the outflow is sealed, obviously the, the microcatheter or whatever catheter you're working through obviously prolapses into the aneurysm. Uh, we do not retract it into the inflow at this point. We leave it within the aneurysm. We, as a routine, fill up the aneurysm, and then we let the coil mass kick us out into the inflow, and then we pack the inflow. That's our, our routine protocol now. So we don't you know, even take the time to explore the concept of um, avoiding the aneurysm. The other thing, which is, again, it's not evidence-based, is a very subjective um, feeling is that once the aneurysm is sealed, it takes far fewer coils to seal the inflow. Right. Everything's good. As you can see now, we're in the aneurysm sac itself, uh, and we're putting in uh, 20 millimeter ONA coils into the aneurysm. This is, I think, the fourth or fifth coil that's going in now. Everything's going extremely smoothly. We are uh, Right now, uh, we're using a uh, 021 uh, prograde catheter, which is distributed by Terumo. Uh, the other catheter, which is really good with this coil delivery system, is the Renegade STC catheter. Uh, that's an excellent catheter. With these coils in particular, which is in uh, distinction to some of the 018 detachable coils, you need to have a, uh, a 021 catheter. That's one of the most important things. Uh, some of the other coils, which are ONA detached, will require an 027 catheter. So this is obviously critical information you need to know when you're planning your case. Uh, but uh, everything's been going incredibly smoothly, and uh, you know we've. I think this is a total of uh, for the entire case so far eight or nine coils. Once our microcatheter gets kicked out of the aneurysm. We may, we may very well switch over to uh, 035 detachable coils just to do the inflow. We may very well need just one or two 035 detachable coils. I, I think we're going to be you know, kicked out of the aneurysm very soon. Uh, and then I'm, I'm perfectly ready to switch over to you know, one or two 035 coils to seal up the inflow. And then we're, we're going to be done. As a side note, we're actually putting in the 035 coil right now, uh, Aaron and uh, Marcello. 
Uh, and as you can see, it's you know packing up the space nicely. We'll probably end up putting in one or two more of these, and then I think we'll be done. Which coil is that, Rob? Uh, this is a 035 interlock detachable coil. 